Uh, Artyom Magun is professor of democratic theory, chair of the Department of Political Science and Sociology at the European University and at St. Petersburg. Uh, he authored uh, such books as Negative Revolution, 2013, um, is the editor of The Politics of the One, uh, authored a number of articles in philosophy, political theory, and is the member of the group Что делать? Uh, and the floor is yours. Thanks for inviting me to this conference. <clears throat> this, the subject of which was a surprise to me, I must say, because <clears throat> I have never considered this issue before actually being in, having been invited to this conference. So I had to figure out what I think about the subject of the man and woman. But you know that I always give talks on negativity. So not surprisingly, this will be a talk on negativity in humans. Uh, and uh, as the, the, the subtitle shows, I will speak of three major thinkers of men, uh, major anthropologists, Arnold Gellin, Paolo Virno, and uh, uh, Boris Porshnev, whom the non-Russian audience probably doesn't know, but uh, <clears throat> as I will show, is actually much better than the two other ones. Uh, uh, <laughs> And uh, 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 the, uh, all, all of them are on the negative essence of humanity. Uh, the problem of a human being, or of being human, is in philosophy a question of an ontic or existential anchoring of the problem of knowledge as such. Indeed, the reflection on the world and on our own practice in it reveals to us the a priori structures and constructions which would make the practice meaningless and the world worthless unless these structures have an external significance of a sort. Either they are a gift of God or a form of a purposeful development of matter or a seed of a promised future, but they have to mean something, the a priori structures. However, a mere positing of an ex external a priori principle, such as an in inborn idea, a law of nature, an eternal soul, uh, or, or the like, would in turn make knowledge in the final analysis irrational, showing no inner logic or meaning. Therefore, a true theory, good theory, should somehow combine the imminent analysis of the world as a product of our possible action. How is the world possible? Why logically are our habits and institutions necessary and just, and so on? So this on the one hand and the ontological analysis of something else that, that acts on it and in it. So there should be an imminent part, and I would not say transcendent, but ontological part. Let, let us call such combined theory a reflexive egocentrism, where our ines inescapable sphere of meaning appears as finite in the context of a larger, decentered whole. Such theory can take various forms, a theory of universe, a theory of life, theory of humankind, theory of the Western Enlightenment, theory of modernity, and finally, theory of ego itself. In each case, there is a further bifurcation of such theory into a mythical and logical account. Thus, the archaic myth made the question of meaning into the question of origin and resolved it via a narrative of emergence and or of heroic breakthrough. Men and women were created in the form of God, in the image of God, I'm sorry, were made of clay, or they were sown as seeds into earth, or, it, or something like this. And then also something else happened. Like, for example, they sinned, and then they started to understand good and evil, or some cultural hero brought them fire, or the like. Uh, so. This, uh, 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 this kind of myth, of course, depends uh, from some fantastic higher creature and is thus not fully imminent. But the origi origination is here supposed to repeat cyclic cyclically and is imminent in this sense. On the other hand, there is a logical path, 
which would uh, uh, deduce consciousness uh, uh, out of, uh, well, simply deduce consciousness, logically. For example, of an absoluteness, of the idea of the absolute, like in Ansel. Or on the opposite, uh, we can deduce, log uh, deduce consciousness from, an, uh, from our doubt, from, uh, as in Descartes, or from uh, the logical inconsistence of the notion of being, like in Hegel. Uh, those would also be attempts at, Im at an imminent uh, uh, foundation, imminent self-foundation, but of course the problem is that then we uh, <clears throat> uh, we, we risk a, a certain kind of solipsism, and uh, we uh, lack a, an external instance of uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 which is problematic given our f obvious finitude. So what we need <clears throat> is something in between. Namely, a theory of, event, of an eventful origin that would remain imminent and thus leave space for meaning, meaningful agency and logical understanding. Uh, something like Badiou's meta theory of history, uh, where uh, it is only an event, a tectonic shift within a situation that can ground subjectivity in an ontological horizon, while at the same time, leaving it agency and also explaining its motion, not rest. So, uh, but of course in Badiou, it's, uh, 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 it's, uh, uh, he, Badiou doesn't have a, a, a general theory of history for Badiou event is simply a form of thinking historicity over any given situation. While uh, here, if we pose the question of hum humankind, we need something larger. Uh, and of course, Frank uh, already mentioned that, but you might have some response to this, but uh, again, he doesn't have a history of humanity uh, yet. <clears throat> uh, so uh, from all this, there, is, uh, uh, there follows the importance of anthropology as one version of reflective egocentrism that I evoked. And uh, therefore, the, the question on the essence of the human. Human beings elaborate their consciousness together. Therefore, in a sense, they form a collective transcendental subject, a collective ego. And the question of its emergence therefore takes a biozoological side. How are we different both from the inanimate things and from other animals, namely apes, from those to whom we cannot communicate our ideas? So we can communicate our ideas to our peers, so we think of ourselves as a collective, but then we find a limit. We cannot communicate to, to animals any longer. And therefore, uh, 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 the, 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 the question is, uh, what, what is the status of those things with which we cannot communicate and those which, with which we can? For this question to be put philosophically and not mythically or logically, it has to be tripartite. First, what would our consciousness or free agency mean from the point of view of non-human life? And vice versa, what does being an ape mean from the point of view of freedom and truth? And again, Frank already evoked this question, like what does uh, an animal think of itself at the moment when it acquires consciousness? And finally, the third question, what was the event what was and what is in the event of emergence of humanity out of mere animality. If such an event of origin is thinkable, it should be one that would have an imminent meaning and to some extent continue, continue today so that a human being is something that emerged and keeps emerging. Otherwise, such an event would only have an archival value. Temporality, the unity of motion, is actually part of the things that stand here in the need of explanation. Therefore, we cannot assume temporality and say that the event is something of the past. No, the event that we are looking for must be uh, recurrent. So that, that much for a preface. Uh, in the 20th century, there was a consensus 
on the direction of in which to search such an origin of uh, man. More or less a consensus. And under different titles, the answer was negativity. Not a new idea in philosophy, since it was elaborated by Hegel and his school. But in the 20th century, it was given a concrete and more materialist face uh, by uh, the attempt at a more secular and prosaic thought. Against the former attempts to uh, uh, sacralize humans and relate them to the absolute or to the transcendent uh, God, here on the contrary, human being is presented as deficient with regard to animality. A great solution to the pro problem of the immanent and the transcendent. Nature would only play a role in the birth of consciousness in that it would recede, right? So yes, there is a natural origin of human, but the origin is that nature recedes, and therefore it opens a space for our agency, for our consciousness. This is the standard anthropological logic. Uh, <clears throat> uh, an event of emergence, if it is evoked in such theories, is some kind of disaster, a negative revolution of nature. The essence of humans is conveniently generalized then as pure indeterminacy and openness. The essence, their essence would be not to have any essence. And again, Frank already referred to that. Uh, negation is then implicitly understood as nihil negativum, a sheer indeterminate absence. And there are many kinds of negations. There is nihil negativum, nihil privativum. One would add nihil contrarium. Uh, I refer to my book, but, uh, and I will not elaborate this any longer, but uh, we will return to this. This is important. So this is not just any negation. It's an indeterminate negation. So the price of this solution is, uh, uh, unfortunately, the danger of nihilism, with its double face of opportunism and melancholia. How to avoid it, and what are the most interesting attempts to reconstruct the origin of humanity, will be my subject in what follows. The, uh, the solution, uh, this uh, solution about uh, uh, open essence of man, non-essence of man, was actually first suggested by, uh, suggested by Jean-Jacques Rousseau. According to him, human being is a weak and fragile animal whose differentia specifica is perfectibility, an infinite plasticity that makes an animal uh, uh, elaborate, uh, that, that lets the animal uh, elaborate uh, uh, technology, but also abandon its freedom. Because when you develop more technology, you lose your spontaneity, unfortunately. And therefore, uh, there is the idea of lost origin. More precisely, the quality, uh, uh, the loss, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, humans are animals who know how to lose themselves, who can lose their origin and, be, and, be, and are alienated from themselves. The, the result of this in Rousseau is, as we all know, a need of a strong republican state which would recreate artificially what in the, begin, in the beginning had come naturally, which is the freedom and the spontaneity. Uh, so we, we need some kind of machine of spontaneity, which is the state. Uh, in the 20th century, the German philosophical anthropology, and most importantly, Arnold Gellin, follow on Rousseau's path. He was a Nazi too. That's not important. Huh? He's, att he's attentive, yes. Uh, according to him, <laughs> humans are pr prematurely born and therefore uh, deprived of instincts. But not gradually deprived, like in Rousseau, but they just don't have any instincts at all because they are premature. This leads them to an infinite creative capacity, but also to what he calls a sensory overload in their perception, because they actually react to all stimuli at once, 
and not just to those like animals that would start off a reflex. So an animal, according to Gellin, I'm not sure he's, he's right, uh, animal uh, is very focused on uh, the stimu stimuli of its instincts, while uh, humans, they are curious, they see everything, and they pay attention to everything. And it's a problem, because then you are overloaded. Um, but humans are capable of a purposive action, which allows them uh, to select the sensory data and to filter them somehow. Also, they eventually develop a capacity of unloading their overfilled perception. And this is a very important notion in Gellin, unloading. By, because they divert attention from the trivial details of their own activity and uh, 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 of the external world, too. Uh, so they unload uh, uh, consciousness for more complicated things, and uh, everything else becomes automatic. Speech for Galen is actually an instrument of such unloading, because speech allows us to distance uh, to, uh, to, uh, the data, the sensory data. Uh, all, the, all this story ends with the need to create strong social institutions that would set some limits to the negative freedom of humans. Uh, otherwise, uh, these humans fall into melancholia, which is natu naturally there, so to say. N humans are naturally melancholic. They don't have any meaning uh, naturally. So they need to create it artificially through institutions. So it's like Rousseau, except that he was not a big Republican. The institutions <laughs> do not need to be democratic, necessarily. Uh, uh, Maybe better if they are not. Yeah, they must be authoritarian. Meaning should be given. Someone, somewhat similar is actually early Heidegger, who, uh, though he actually rejected anthropology as a discipline, uh, and, by, and even more so biology as a foundation, nevertheless gave an account of human being along the same lines. A man is infinitely open, not because of, of a biological deprivation, but, but because of its unusual attendance to the finite situation or the world, as though uh, proceeding from a fall from grace. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, implicitly for Heidegger, the place of nature is held by the transcend, by, by, by the theological, you know, angel-like condition from which we fall. But then, you know, you, you cut the, the, the first part about wh where we fall from and, and everything, uh, becomes, uh, yeah, a reflexive egocentrism. Um, an obverse side of this openness is the intuition of what Heidegger called the nothingness, which is uh, not a human condition, but the truth of being itself. So here we, of course, surpass anthropology into ontology. This produces anxiety. So in Gellin it's melancholia, in Heidegger it's anxiety. Uh, but also this produces a capacity of a resolute, responsible agency. And this is like in Gellin. But in Heidegger, of course, little is said about the socio-political consequence of all this, except the fact that, of course, we all, we experience this all together as a midzai. In the same school, it is symptomatic to, it, it, is, it is important to evoke Jean-Paul Sartre's uh, uh, later attempt of building a materialist anthropology in the critique of dialectical reason. What uh, had earlier uh, been the negative act of consciousness for Sartre himself, uh, who in his uh, uh, being and nothing is rather a Hegelian. Uh, 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 here becomes the objective condition of scarcity, which becomes a ground for the free, but at the same time natur naturally determined transformative activity of humans the economically determined uh, uh, cre creative activity uh, over the nature. Uh, <clears throat> again, there is this original negativity that uh, launches the humankind as, as a project, launches the human history. And again, if er in early Sartre it is purely subjective, here it is rather objective. Uh, but generally, in the second half of the century, biology and philosophy mostly parted ways in continental Europe, 
and the focus of anthropological theory is switched to language in its structuralist version as a system. Therefore, the considerations of uh, the kind of uh, uh, Galen were not very popular. And there is only now uh, a time of a renewed interest in the origin of humanity, in the, in the essence of humanity from the biological point of view. In this conte context, we have, uh, uh, for instance, and for a very important instance, uh, the recent work of Paolo Virno. Most importantly, his essay on negation, which appeared a year ago and is as yet available only in Italian, in which I... No, it's not. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, uh, yeah, I read it in Italian. My Italian is bad, so maybe I made mistakes anyway. I apologize in advance. Uh, Virno inverts, uh, uh, inverts the argument of Galen and Rousseau. The biological essence of humans is, according to him, not the deficiency or a deprivation, but the capacity of active negation, which is inherent in language. So, in a sense, he returns to a Hegelian solution. Human language, unlike the animal one, possesses this peculiar power of undoing what has been said, or even experienced sensually. This allows a human being to become less sensitive to the behavior of other beings. A human being is paradoxically less mimetic than the other animals. Um. <laughs> no, I will include an ape. Uh, uh, I must, but I should have. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, to prove this, Virno actually makes a seemingly materialist reference to the mirror neurons, the cells in the brain that are supposedly responsible for spontaneous imitation and for the empathy with the representatives of one's genus. Humans, <clears throat> humans, thanks to language, know how to block the action of these neurons. Although I didn't understand from Pierno's book how they do this. Maybe my, my Italian is bad. But, uh, 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 in, in some way, in some way they, they manage to, to block the action of these mirror neurons. Uh, and uh, Hence, uh, there emerges a complex, a complex dialectical structure of the human relationship to others. Humans are individually emancipated. They are cap capable of individu individuation because of this capacity to negate. But uh, at the same time, they are capable of brutality to their peers. They are able of intergeneric struggle. And thus, they, they are radically evil. But at the same time, they must develop, also through language, a set of countermeasures to this danger. Language resocializes humans by creating a sphere of artificial mimesis, the public sphere, as formed, for example, by the common places in language, in the language, by the language as a common thing, thing produced by the commons and through commons. You know, this th theme of uh, you know uh, uh, commonality, general intellect. Uh, so you lose the capacity of uh, 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 sociability, you isolate from the community, but then you restore the community through language. So language plays a double role. It allows you to negate, but it also allows you to reproduce the, uh, yeah, the, the social bond. Uh, actually, the state does the same thing. So this solution is, sounds similar to Rousseau and Galen, but uh, again, this is not the most clear point for me, but it appears that uh, the state does the same thing, but does it badly in a very brutal way. Uh, while the public sphere is an organic linguistic way of reacting to negativity within its own milieu. So the public sphere is a negation of negation. Lorenzo is translating this uh, book, so he will correct me. Uh, the contemporary references of this account are obvious. It is topical. Today's information society is pushing for constant imitation. So humans are actually blessed by being able to negate, negate and to reject peer pressure. 
But at the same time, because of this, they run into the risks of horrible crimes, like the Holocaust, which we are not actually evokes. Therefore, we need the communitarian publicness as opposed to the neutral monstrosity of both the capital and the state. We need rhetoric as opposed to the bureaucratic rationality. Again, <clears throat> uh, uh, I uh, uh, draw your attention to the fact that by negation, Virno emphatically means the indeterminate negation, the nihil negativum, and he actually explicitly uh, argues that. The, this uh, capacity to negate is a, is a capacity simply to say non-X. So you evoke X, but you at the same time neutralize it. For example, he says that a Nazi in the camp, he could feel the emotions of a Jew he tortured, but at the same time he somehow distanced himself from it. Funny music. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, yes, so uh, you have this weak indeterminate negation, uh, but it's enough to, to, have to make this work. Uh, <clears throat> ingenious as this account of Virno is, and justified as he is in returning from the objectivist negative anthropology to the active Hegelian no as a locus of origin, there are also some problems in this. First, like in Galen and unlike Rousseau, the given picture is completely ahistorical. Human being emerges fully armed, or rather disarmed, and presents a perennial problem of combining socialization uh, with individuation. This has to do with, the, with this understanding of negation as a sheer nihil negativum. As such, it does not have enough real force to undo what it negates or to subordinate it to a new order. Uh, second thing, second problem, is that there is an asymmetry between the materiality, sorry, the, the materially inbuilt, thingly, mirror neurons that are responsible for empathy, and the voluntaristic and miraculous negation through language. Uh, this contradicts the requirement that the origin is imminent, so it's unclear again what happens to the mirror neurons. Uh, and so you have, on the one hand, the nature, and on the other hand, the immaterial culture. Not nice. Uh, <clears throat> sociability, the original sociability, is then kind of a dogma. And then you try to fight with it, but then you re reproduce it at the higher level. And thirdly, and here I'm a little ironic, there is a tricky problem. Virno, in this work, quite clo closely reproduces a work that he doesn't know of. This is the theory of, this, of a Soviet scholar, Boris Porshnev, author of a magisterial treatise on the origin of human history, 1974, which has never been translated into foreign languages, unlike other works by Porshnev, which Virno actually knows. I talked to him about that. Uh, 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 so uh, uh, Virno knows about the existence of Porsche, but of course he's not familiar with this book. But what he says is actually very, very close to what Porsche says. <clears throat> but Porsche's theory, as I already said, is more complicated. Unlike Virno, Porsche. Uh, Porshnev uh, was both a philosopher, uh, he's the most good looking, uh, uh, and, an, uh, and an experimental scientist. Uh, mm, uh, a very encyclopedic kind of mind. Uh, and he was schooled both in the tradition of Soviet physiology, uh, mainly, uh, the main name is here Uchtomsky, a, a genius of physiology, which is also not very well known in the West, uh, or, uh, as well as uh, Nikolai Bernstein, <clears throat> and Soviet psychology, Vygotsky and Luria. Uh, uh, Porshnev uh, uh, drew on both of these traditions. Uh, and he has books on history, on the French peasant wars, etc., but his main interest was in the early uh, human history, uh, paleontology, basically. But he, he understood paleontology as history. 
And based on these studies, he advanced a complicated dialectical theory that I will now try to summarize for you. It's not easy. And I will do it point by point. First, humans are speaking animals. This explains not just the consciousness, but also history as a story of class struggle. Human domination over one another is the fact that became possible only through language. Because you cannot be a slave without actually talking about this with your master. <clears throat> Sorry, but it's true. Therefore, uh, we need to explain language, first of all, as a fact of power, and humans as the animals who have power. Sounds Nietzschean, but of course he only quotes Marx. But this is typical for Soviet, Soviet for, typical for Soviet intellectuals <laughs> of the time. But yeah. uh, so it's actually this theory is not Marxist at all. But he is in explicit uh, 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 argument uh, with Engels actually, because for Engels it's the labor that created uh, uh, man, and Porzhnev radically uh, rejects this. He says that labor is only possible when you give instructions, injunctions. So either you give injunctions to others to work or you give injunctions to yourself. Otherwise, there is no work. So ultimately, it all comes to power. And power comes back to language. So man is created by language. Again, well, not a very original state. <clears throat> Second, early human beings survived by uh, uh, being apes who descended from trees to the earth, to the ground. The question, how did they manage to do this, lacking any means of defense against predators? Uh, <clears throat> there were strong predators at the time, and humans cannot run fast, they do not have uh, needles, uh, uh, they, um, uh, <clears throat> they are not large, so basically they, they would have been destroyed, uh, extinguished, uh, if they didn't have some defense that we didn't know. And his hypothesis is that the, the language was such a defense. Uh, uh, they, these early humans could somehow stop the animals or control them through voice uh, in some cases. But in most cases, they would uh, proceed more methodically and they would actually tame some, some predators and then use them against others. So uh, uh, they would have some friend animal who would cover them against the other animals. So, so, so the time of service No. <laughs> Katie, could you please? I'm sorry. Uh, 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 third point. Neurophysiologically, this means that the early language must have developed through what he calls an inhibition dominant. Tarmaznaya dominanta. The dominant dominante is the term of Uchtomsky. It's a uh, phenomenon, uh, physiological phenomenon, when many different stimuli actually run into the funnel of one action. Uh, and uh, according to, to Porshnev, uh, for each action dominant, there is an... Uh, <clears throat> a correlate inhibition dominant. So uh, a, a, a nervous center and a behavior that blocks the prior uh, center. So it's an antagonist of, of the first center. Uh, uh, each, uh, yeah, uh, each uh, neurological center has this antagonist. <clears throat> the, uh, and it's not simply neurological center, but it's, uh, the whole schema of behavior. The scheme of behavior is incompatible with the, uh, <clears throat> the action in question. <clears throat> uh, and language was a usage of such inhibition dominant. So you reproduce a behavior which the other animal mimes. Of course, everyone in physiology knows that animals mime each other without mirror neurons, you know, it's not a big uh, discovery. So uh, through this mimetic mechanism, uh, according to Porshnev, humans uh, made animals re reproduce the actions that would block their aggressive behavior. Uh, 
uh, and he calls this an interdiction. This is the, the first language, the origin of signification. Uh, so the first word, the first language was language of negation, but not simply an indeterminate negation, not a nihil, priva, a nihil negativum like in Virno, but this is a nihil privativum, this is an active contrary force. This, however, is not the end of the story. A simple interdiction is still an indeterminate blockage of behavior. But the early humans quickly started to direct this interdiction against their peers, not only against animals, but against their peers. And therefore, these other peers developed a skill of counter-interdiction. So, uh, counter-suggestion comes next. It's, he has term, terminology, it's complex. You can call this counter-suggestion, but strictly speaking, it's counter-interdiction. So, uh, because the first was not yet a suggestion, it was interdiction. So this counter-interdiction is when you actually uh, find an antagonist of this previous antagonist. So it's not symmetrical. The antagonist of the antagonist is not the, the first movement, but something else. And this he actually shows experimentally. He, uh, uh, he, he made experiments by you know, blocking one movement in animals and then evoking another, then blocking this one. This is possible to reproduce. Uh, <clears throat> So apparently uh, there was uh, a counter sign in the, uh, in, 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 in the first humans, C counter language against this first language. Uh, and this already means that the, there was an inversion in the, no, in the, in the phenomenon of language. The, the, uh, the first language, if it was still close to animal signals, was now inverted, it was transformed. And actually, it's very important portion of evokes that uh, 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 human language is opposite to animal language. Animal language is based on inspiration, and human language is based on expiration. <clears throat> but it, even this was not the end, Be because there was yet a third level, a negation of negation, through which those who had interdicted learn to break through the, the obstacles of counter language. And uh, uh, so they, they made basically, they repeated the same operation again. And then Porshnev says, only at this point we have the developed language, a, a phrase. We have a determined instruction, do this. So uh, <clears throat> not just a blockage, but an injunction. Uh, he actually uses Kant's categories of modality and says that the first interdiction says nilzia, not allowed. The counter interdiction says "Možna," allowed. And the final injunction says you must. Uh, mm, uh, the, mm, <clears throat> so but in, in our language, and this is already close to our contemporary, this is what is suggestion. This is suggestion. And therefore, uh, our contemporary language, in its suggestive power, it always contains already this di dialectic. You always break the, the resistance. Fifth point. So these early human hypnotizers directed their powers against themselves, thus creating political power, consciousness, and labor. All of these are explained, uh, 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 Porshnev explains all of these through the uh, uh, phenomenon of auto-injunction. After instruction. This is a revision of the Marxist argument that labor was an origin of humanity. This origin is political. You can think of people like uh, Pierre Clastre, for example, uh, as a, a closer to Porshnev's argument. <clears throat> the political is the only solution here. Here, Virno actually agrees. But unlike Virno, for whom the material ground from which this human start off is trivial imitation present in all animals, for Porshnev, it is hypnotic interdiction. Thus, history is not about the relationship between the an individual and the species, but about a split within the species and the re relations of domination and emancipation. So if Virno is here kind of a soft com communitarian, uh, uh, Porshnev is a hardline Nietzsche. So, uh, then, uh, of course, Porshnev emphasizes a gap between humans and animals. A, a gap that is reflected 
and reinforced in within human language. Human language, as I said, is opposed to the animal language. It, it's uh, expiration, not inspiration, and also human language must be materially unrelated to the de designated object because it is based on this prior ne negativity, negation. Uh, it is excluded that uh, our word is a part of what we are talking about. And if by chance it is, it is similar, it is actually the, the, the language, you know, uh, disavows it. Uh, uh, therefore, mm, uh, yeah, and, and this is because, of course, the uh, original language was meant to block, not to facilitate. Therefore, the first origin of humanity is actually an anti-humanity, a fierce hypnotizing power. And I quote, I just, I'm close to my conclusion, but I want you to hear Borshnev's words. Here is it, it is in Russian, the table quote. I know, mm -hmm. yeah, I've, I'm conscious about the time. Uh, <clears throat> if history is development, if development is mutual transformation of countries, then out of an animal, there emerged something contrary to what had developed in the course of history later. The question is to reconstruct the beginning of history by contrasting it with the current and recent state of things. Historical approach requires not a recognition of the same essence in a past shell, but a discovery of an essentially contrary substance, even in what may seem similar to what may seem similar to our own time. Actually, methodological considerations that are quite close to Foucault's at the, made at the same period. But of course, for Porshnev, it's dialectics, and Foucault does no such word. Uh, the, the, uh, then, uh, mm, uh, uh, tra uh, sorry, uh, another quote. Uh, uh, a transition from an animal to a human being should not be thought at a, as a struggle of two principles. The principles, for, for example, animal against human. One must conceive also a principle, a third principle, that gradually regresses in history and is absent both in the animal and a human. A negation of the zoological, which is even more increasingly denied by a human. And this is this, you know, hypnotizing brutality, which it is uh, a negativity. This negativity uh, is what created uh, humans, and but then it must recede. It must recede. It's, it's, it's within the humans. It's something that is unconscious. That is on the on the on the uh, on the descent. Uh, or you can say with Zizek that this is kind of a va vanishing mediator uh, that uh, is uh, gradually lost, even though it oca occasionally returns. Somewhat similar is also Freud with his story about the primitive uh, horde, horde, how do you say, uh, 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 which all, uh, w uh, w uh, with this, you know, father, uh, mm, uh, primordial father, because this is the original of humanity again. This is the humanity, this is not animality. But we lo lose it and we live already in the post uh, primordial phase where we, are, we, we have killed the father. So in this, but Porshnev doesn't make this uh, rapprochement, but apparently, of course, he must have known Freud. Uh, <clears throat> so a civilized human being is only possible as a negation of a negation, a negation of its own na natural essence. And uh, to refer to the topic of the, uh, today's conference, of course, man is anti-man. Uh, uh, and humanism must be anti-human. Uh, Arguing with Galen and the like, who argue that a human being is defined by the lack of instincts, uh, the question, says Porchnev, is, uh, <clears throat> what destroyed the instincts? What kind of a hammer smashed them during the rel relatively fast transition from the paleoanthropos to neoanthropos? The new regulator that annulled, inhib inhibited, annihilated the injunctions of the inherited instincts again and again was the second system of signals, the speech interaction. Now, clearly, Porshnev's reconstruction contains a lot of guesses and sometimes fall falls into myth. However, the same is true of any reconstruction of origin. 
think of Bing Bang Theory or of Freud's uh, psychology of early children or of Melanie Klein, you always do guesswork. And uh, sometimes this guesswork is mythical. But the benefit of this theory is its historical and eventful understanding of humanity. And this is what distinguishes him from Virno. This, this story is imminent in that it clearly associates early history with what is so important for us now, communication, the information bomb, and the ubiquity of hypnotic, fascinating forces around us. Unlike Virno, Porshnev sees this situation not as the problem of solidarity, individuality, and compassion, but mostly as the problem of power. From the media, from television, from internet, everyone tries to hypnotize us, to draw our attention through uh, some kind of plots, uh, through pictures, through uh, speech, and uh, we need some kind of uh, counter strategy. What Porshnev says is that basically this had already been the case for uh, the early humans. Uh, but like Virno, actually, and this is what is common for them, uh, both, uh, they see language as an interplay of opposite forces. In Virno, it's integration and enemy, and in Porshnev, it's domination and revolt. Both authors reject the, the theory of Rousseau and Galen about the essential deficiency of a human being and of the consequent depressive tendency. Human negativity is a substantive active force, not a default condition. Even though there may be a resonance between an external deprivation in some things, such as external defenses, and excess in others, such as mimicry and signaling. Now, negativity is an equivocal concept, as I already said. It includes at least a simple negation, a privation, and a contrary inversion. Gellin and Virno say that a human is a non-animal. Porshnev adds that yes, but he or she is also a counter animal. What can this mean? In fact, inversion is the result of an incompletion of a simple negation. What is merely negated survives, like in Freud's, this is not my mother. Knowing this, the act of inversion incorporates into itself what is negated and reveals the positive agent of the original negation, which in the original negation it is implicit, now it's explicit. This is the negative force. Therefore, contrariness, the contrary, is a reflexive and efficient negation. In this sense, uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 in Virno, this non-animal denies itself, but always remains near itself. But Porshnev's anti-animal is a species that do doesn't just block the action of others, but learns to give them substantive commands not just purposively suppresses its own nature, uh, uh, <clears throat> but subordinates animals uh, and even parts, part of its own species and is also in constant fight against this other part. Language, similarly, is anti-language. It blocks instead of stimulating, but also then re-stimulates re what, what is blocked. In this sense, humans appear as a demonic and revolutionary element of nature. They are intellectual rebels against the brutal force and the fierce discursive masters of the working slaves. Finally, they are rebellious slaves armed by a revolutionary word. Then finally, perhaps, humans would suspend all of this into a playful alternation of science. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Artyom. Um, I've learned lots of new things and it was really, really very inspiring. Um, I invite uh, our audience to put questions, maybe. If there are any questions, please ask. You can ask them in Russian and we will send them to you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Thank you very much, Artemi. Um, thank you for actually bringing to our attention the work of Poshnev, because 
didn't know anything about it. I know Virno worked on Vygotsky a lot, but there are names he doesn't mention a lot. They have this influence of Vygotsky in common, yeah. so this explains some yeah, proximity. Yeah, but I would be interested in knowing more about references of stuff you said it, that was translated into, into other, other languages. Other works yes, of him, but yes. not this one. So that was like just a remark. On Virno, I, I generally agree with your, um, with your assessment, your critical assessment of Virno. And I would also be even more critical when it comes to actually putting together what is his philosophical anthropology with his politics. Because I think that passage doesn't work at all in Vienna. So let's say like three stages. First stage, um, out of Italy, Virno is mostly know, known for drummer of multitude, which doesn't tell you much about his big project, long-term project, which is actually thinking philosophical anthropology again. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Sartre, because I think like after Sartre, in a way, after the critique of dialectical uh, reason, which was a political response uh, to uh, Stalinism, he says it very clearly. And that political response for Sartre in entailed creating a new philosophical anthropology. Well, after that, I think Virno has been, in the last 20 years, um, the, 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 the best thinker of a new way of thinking philosophical anthropology. Okay, so first level. Second level would be um, the level of um, anthropogenesis. So, yes, there is an attempt in, in Virno's philosophical anthropology to think a new dialectical uh, materialist uh, notion of anthropogenesis, but then the passage with the biological, the neuronal, is not clear. And I think you pointed it out. The third level, and that would be my father criticism, hence I'm harsher than you on Paolo, mm -hmm. even though I respect his work a lot, I just said it, is uh, the, uh, what I, and I told him this very openly, what I call the uh, kind of uh, common to all by Italian political thinkers, the temptation of a relapse into a Kojevian end of history scenario in politics. And I will mm. say more about this. Mm. So he's a thinker of negativity, of philosophical anthropology thought through a new way of thinking negativity. He looks for a philosophical dialogue with uh, the cognitive sciences, which is also positive. But then if you take his, politi his political notions, his political notions in a sense, think about uh, uh, biocognitive, bi um, bio biopolitical cognitive power, uh, the um, essentially, the assumption there is that the trait of the species, our trait, um, species-specific trait, the invariant, as he calls it, biologically, language, is right now, by late capital, being put into work. You see why I'm saying this? Yes. At the end of history scenario, there is a temptation, which is a very Negrian temptation, to say that history right now is like history has nev never been before through capital. Mm -hmm. You see my point? That, that's why I think there is an end of history um, risk there. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a kind of like Negrian Kojevianism, <laughs> which, which destroys politically. Uh, can you explain a little bit more? Why, uh, why is it unprecedented that capital puts to work our well, human let's capacity? Let's say like a digital economy. If you, yes. I mean, Vino sides with all the post workers, with Andrea Fumagalli, with Christian Marazzi, but the point is like uh, Christian Marazzi, Andrea Fumagalli, when you talk to Andrea, Andrea is an economist. So he, he buys his ontology from Negri, full stop. So if you start from Negri, his Pinozian presuppositions, okay, that makes sense because in a sense, immanence has always been immanent, et cetera, et cetera. If you start from negativity, like oh. Virno does, then you have a big jump see, there, you see? see. Like, so I think there is this idea of saying, uh, it is right now with digital economy, with uh, uh, biocognitive uh, power, as Fumagalli calls it, that for the first time, our invariant biological traits are being put into work. Mm. And I think that ontologically, this is totally wrong. I mean, unless you are a Spinozist. Yeah. Yeah, but mm -hmm. to think political resistance, this is the ontological assumption they all make. All other post-workers make this assumption because they are Spinozist, the default Spinozist, but Vietnam yeah. is not. Mm -hmm. So the tension is even oh, bigger. Yeah, thank you. No, I mean, it's <laughs> I don't need to respond, but that was very helpful. Thanks. Uh, Frank, uh, well, mm -hmm. no, Frank, was, Frank, Frank was first. I'm sorry. 
Uh, thanks so much, Artemi. Um, I was wondering, um, because you pointed, uh, you made the three points in the beginning, what does human life look from the non-human perspective? And, and the second point, or third point you made, was what is the limits of communication, in some sense? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what is that to which we cannot communicate? And I was wondering, in uh, portion of, um, is there a limit to communication? Is, I mean, there a is there a limit to communication? It, does the whole story not only function because there is the assumption that there is no limit to communication mm -hmm. among... Mm -hmm. So it's a transcendental account, right? I mean, it says signs, not even language in the... I mean, I can communicate with my dog, yeah, practically, sure. because the, the thing understands Mother. signs, clearly. So it's not, it's not necessarily language, but signs as such enable the whole narrative of the emergence of, uh, of the human species. So in some sense, that there are signs, that there is communication, is the quasi, or not even quasi, transcendental condition that one needs to subscribe to to tell this, have this genealogy, right? Which, I mean, yeah. That, so you mean that it is a tautological, that in the sense that because you read signs, right? Therefore, you, you, interpret, yeah, you, mm, the, uh, you interpret everything as sign, so to say. But no, uh, let's put it like that. Uh, first I thought, r because you emphasized the, let's say, Nietzscheanism, right? Um, first I thought it would be an account of forces turning against other forces, um, like active forces, yeah. redetermining other forces to become... This is Deleuze and Nietzsche. Yes, of course, of course. Um, but then I thought, okay, uh, you, you emph emphasized um, that everything begins somehow with the first interdiction. And, or, to put it simply, from the link, from the transition from inspiration to expiration. Mm -hmm. This is completely crucial. And, but even inspiration animal language is based on signs, right? Yes. So w the presupposition seems to be that there will always have been signs, always. So there is always, this is what I mean with the transcendental account, latent meaning. So in, in this sense, the explanation relies on what it presupposes. So if meaning is always latently there, the whole story is just a realization or an actualization of the latent potential of the signs. Mm -hmm. So, in some sense, it seems very convincing, but at the same time, it just explains what it invested. Right? Or may, maybe I'm saying it's just like a, a question of clarification because I don't know the <coughs> word at all. Yeah. Well, I mean, this part about, uh, you know, the philosophical part uh, was mine. I mean, then uh, Porzhenev has a slightly different, you know, epistemology. Uh, but I agree with much of what he said, uh, epistemologically. Uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 uh, what, what I meant by imminent uh, was precisely to say that you cannot avoid some kind of loop in, to, in, in, the, in, the, in answering the question of your own origin. Because really, I mean, you, you cannot, uh, you think uh, uh, everything in terms of your measure of uh, you measure against yourself uh, uh, the world and uh, therefore you cannot really think anything that would not be measured through your kind of particular existence this Kantian uh, idea holds true and in this sense you cannot <coughs> actually uh, uh, break through this uh, solipsism you cannot but you must because otherwise, everything loses meaning. Therefore, there are some, you know, cun uh, uh, some cunning uh, uh, technologies of how to think the unthinkable, of how to think the origin uh, of what is abs uh, not absolute, but of what is uh, an inescapable. Uh, and that's precisely the task of all these anthropologies. So uh, again, negativity gives a, a, a way to do it by saying nature recedes or you negate nature, for example. So you negate, so 
that's why you understand it. But still, it was there. So there was something, something happened before. You know, Mia Su's, uh, for example, problem. Okay, you, you, you can explain everything by your mind. You can be a correlationist. But then think of a fossil, right? So it's, it's by the way, similar kind of problem, paleontological problem. Uh, and uh, uh, again, uh, the event also. The event is a conceptual tool also meant to describe our transcendental horizon, but in its emergence. So how is it, you know, does it emerge also from something else? Because originally there is a situation and then there is an event. Again, logically, it's inevitably circular, as you rightly said, but probably we need to live with it. Uh, it's a hermeneutical circle, we can say. The, um, as for the signs, as for the meanings, yes, but let's, uh, in general, you are right. That, of course, because humans only perceive everything through language, they, uh, for them, the question of uh, nature is also the language of nature. Yes, but... Uh, <clears throat> For, for Porshnev, at least, uh, uh, you, you, can, yeah, you can objectively see that uh, there is a language you understand, there is a language you cannot understand. There is, a language, there is uh, a language you can teach an animal and there is a language you can't. And they tried. And actually with apes you have some, you, you can teach them small phrases. But with other animals it's impossible. So the, the, uh, there is a limit to... To, to, uh, to, to language and the language that we have in animals. Yes, there is language, but it's qualitatively different, and this he insists upon. So, again, this is uh, maybe a response to the transcendental problem is dialectical, right? So, yes, you, you, ha you live in an inescapable uh, structure of categories, but it is internally contradictory. And so look into what in these uh, uh, in, in, in your structure of categories send back, sends back to what you have suppressed as an origin. This may be the way to, to go. Uh, uh, while, uh, again, Porshnev insists, and rightly, I think, on the dialectical nature of human emergence and on the fact that humans are opposite to animals. So he, is very, he would be very much against what Oksana likes, you know, these kind of continuous stories about how, you know, uh, a cat is also like a human, but not quite, uh, or he's even better, maybe. But uh, there, there, there is a gap. There is a gap. That's very important. And, but, and this gap is not a gap of soul and matter. If, if language somehow dialectically, by negating, by force of negation, emerges out of the functioning system of sign language, let's call it like that. Yes, yeah, signals. Yes. Th doesn't, in some sense, this pose the question how signs emerge? Because this would then mm. account for the potential, the negative potential of the emergence of human beings. So, in some mm. sense, yes, that's right. Isn't, isn't I that? I mean, doesn't it? Signatura rerum. Yes, this is the language of science. Yeah. But that's what Frank yeah. means in a way. Yeah. Yes. But, well, signatura rerum exists for us, while for, uh, in, well, it, again, in our perspective, uh, 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 animals surely have uh, languages, but uh, they, um, it's the so-called first signal system in, in, in the language of Soviet physiology. The, uh, <clears throat> they, these signals operate on the level of reflexes. They stimulate activity. Uh, uh, and uh, again, uh, the uh, human animal emerged from it on its basis, but emerged into something different. Okay, and Alexei had a question. Yes, uh, yes, I just continue with what already uh, Lorenz and uh, 
Frank was saying. First about uh, Wierner, I think it's a very good point that uh, it's, of course, it's, he has this, uh, he elaborates the philosophical anthropology just to justify his political project in a way, like saying, for example, if human nature is considered as good, so you will have an anarchist position, uh, or if you, human nature is considered as something bad and dangerous, could be sort of conservative position, you need a strong state to control these dangerous uh, human beings and so on and so on. But generally, I think this transition is very complicated and not so, because it's, it's some time enlightening and gives you some idea. Uh, but at the same time now, for example, uh, uh, I, I mean, to, to argue in the style of Rousseau that human nature is good, for example, so, so it would be... Rousseau has nature and I never said that. No, 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 in, in, in a sort of historical commentary to Rousseau, you can find such opinions on Rousseau, but I understand about this uh, um, first original man and so on. Anyway, and second point that Virna to Artemis, second point is Virna, you cannot reduce Virna anthropology to negativity. It's an important point because Virna has at least three or four other dimensions, uh, like potentiality, mm like uh, also what he calls infinite regress, because I haven't read this part about infinite regress, it's quite a mysterious term for me, but potentiality, uh, uh, he actually derives this term from uh, Ghislaine uh, as a sort of uh, this over, how to say, pr surplus, uh, result of this uh, surplus stimulation uh, uh, or, or being overloaded by stimulus, it's s somehow he translates this into language of potentiality or potency, like all post do. So I mean it generally, uh, generally, uh, it's another question how to translate Wierner uh, into this uh, question of negativity. And, he, and then negativity for him is not Hegelian negativity. It's more, more I think, that it's based more in the pragmat pragmatics of language. Uh, in the pragmatic, uh, because he's interested in the study of sort of pragmatics of language, uh, 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 negations uh, and rejections. So it's not connected to the sort of transcendental logic of negativity derived from Hegel, whatever. In Vierno, it also could be a sort of not criticism, but just to point for ask, asking Artemi maybe. Uh, and about Porchnev, I, I agree uh, that uh, with Artemi totally. I'm very glad that he brought it to the floor. I mean Porchnev because my first impression when I was reading him as a student was a really, really when you it's rare impression from reading of theoretical book when you're totally surprised. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> and Artemi, he he actually downplayed other more. Uh, scandalous part of portion of uh, theory of anthropo anthropogenesis because for him this suggestion and counter suggestion was a struggle between uh, this sort of primordial human horde uh, uh, divided into two parts which one is exactly was weaker and another was stronger and they were cannibals mm -hmm. so it's yeah, uh, so eating. yes and they were eating this weaker part of human uh, humankind and I this count was not the so and for example, and he develops, and he develops. No, I, and that's why actually it, it, this ruined his academic career. This uh, cannibalism hypothesis, and he was considered a little bit like a freaky person, and so and so on. But I think it generally for Soviet theory of 70s, it's like Deleuze and Guattari, his book, because it's written in very avant-garde uh, style. It's it's very dense, uh, like six now uh, for, because it has two edits. One is was. Uh, uh, when he, he was still alive, and then he was published posthumously full text. It's like six, 600 of t uh, pages of very rich text. And the, I think it, it, it's, it's a pity that it wasn't translated yet. And, uh, and uh, so, so he develops a whole uh, hermeneutics of uh, uh, the shift, uh, deciphering contemporary events through this sort of primordial traumatic event of encounter between this weaker part which possess uh, this counter-suggestion and this uh, horrible uh, thriller uh, cannibals, actually. And for example, he has a whole psychoanalysis, or sort of psychoanalytic uh, of contemporary culture, like giving a woman a flower uh, somehow refers to the, uh, this primordial gesture of giving a baby cannibal because it was sort of uh, how to say retaliation and sort of uh, the, the, this weaker humans are giving babies to 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 the the, the cannibals like a sort of uh, sacrifice nice. and, and it's also sacrifice this is not in the, the book not not in the book that was uh, published by the soviets uh, the, yeah. uh, the, yes, the it was in the last. They yes, they censored this part. This part. So I think it's, it's a very. It's bataille also could be linked to <laughs> to uh, to this. Uh, so all these anthropologies, like um, radical anthropologies, and Artemi, uh, Artemi mentioned already Paul Cluster. And the, so it's an extremely rich, interesting text. It's a bit, also, it could be made the link to contemporary work of Agamben, 
because uh, Porzhnev uh, discussed the, the origin of language as a sort of uh, language started from verbs, and verbs were commandments or uh, imperatives. Actually, recent work of Agamben about archaeology of commandments could be quite close to this approach, I think. So it also, also could be uh, done through, 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 I would do another conference about portion, if I would say. And <laughs> also, yes, and so, so, so my, 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 and my final comment is about negativity, because if uh, you, you mentioned this, uh, that uh, somehow a portion of being uh, formed in Soviet Marxist com uh, context, somehow downplays or dismisses the Marxist uh, labor theory. But generally, I think through this question of antagonism between uh, cannibalistic and non-cannibalistic uh, part of this primordial human horde, uh, he is, could be considered sort of Marxist in this way, antagonistic, uh, and, and, so, and so on. So in this sense... Yeah, it's it, it, more Hegelian, you know, yeah, struggle, for a, struggle yeah, between yeah. And, and, also, and Yes, and also it's interesting to... Uh, ask, again, it's, if, if you can try to construct this uh, overarching theory of negativity, which could combine with uh, sort of logical transcendental argumentation with a sort of historicity, referring to this origin, I mean, what would be the, I mean, my question, it would be like a sort of rather joke, what would be the mother of all negations in this case? So, there would be, uh, so I mean, if, <laughs> or father of, because it's really difficult to, somehow to com it's all the problem of uh, since 19th century of, of this sort of trying to combine this empirical historical approach to anthropogenesis and the sort of philosophical argument so for me it's quite of course it's it's your paper and I know some of your previous work I, I mean you could still have space for development argument so for me it's <laughs> quite difficult uh, question for you I think uh, the last question and it's Jans put it directly it's just a really short question. Actually, a uh, follow-up on, on your answer to, to Frank. I wondered when, when you say um, the answer to the, tr to the question of the transcendental could be dialectics, and in uh, this sense, and in this sense uh, then you have to say, okay, we accept somehow the transcendental, but it's internally contradictory. And I wondered, when going back to the beginning of your, of your talk where you mentioned, or where you at least proposed the idea of a history of humanism in some sense, or the, uh, let's say, perhaps the possibility of a history of humanism. I wondered then what this does to your notion of history in this sense, because wouldn't you have then the problem to say at some point that the history of humanism in itself needs to be contradictory, but then from which point actually could this be said or uttered, or how do you, um, how do you cope with this problem of, 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 of contradiction in terms of your notion of history? See, do you see what I mean? I mean yeah, no, but uh, I, I thought that's what I, I tried to, to explain this, that, uh, again, we need some kind of uh, uh, ground, some, some, some foundation uh, of the transcendental. And, uh, of course, if we think transcendental in the Kantian way as a simply a formal apparatus, then we run into... Uh, an aporia, uh, or like a thing in itself or something. Mm, uh, so we posit something uh, uh, outside and then this outside becomes a dogma. Uh, but in the Hegelian uh, approach, uh, or in any in German idealist approach, this uh, problem kind of disappears. Uh, well, to some extent, that because uh, you, uh, <coughs> you can always say that uh, yes, of course, uh, we, uh, in, uh, we, we have already um, a, a, a some kind of a format to perceive and understand everything. But we, we, this format is also to, uh, to understand, uh, mm, yeah, to, to, uh, to understand the questions, to understand the problems, to understand the ununderstandable. Uh, and uh, uh, after you figure this out and after you split, your universe into the op opposing parts through the imminent analysis, then you can distribute these parts through time, through history, uh, by saying that this is the, the hidden origin here, this is the hidden origin here, and this is the event that st uh, that still goes on, 
and that is actually the event uh, of the clash between these uh, parts. And these, uh, basically this clash is what is the real about all this. While of course you cannot jump out of your consciousness and say, oh, and here I found the biological foundation of my consciousness. This is ridiculous. I mean, from the point of view of philosophy, even though the, this is what neuroscience does. Uh, 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 but uh, this is, again, not to say that we should simply abandon the question of origin and the question of materialism. Yeah, th th this was my... To, to Leosha, I mean, it was a comment. I don't know. Think, yeah, I mean, uh, you, you say that negation in Vilno doesn't have to do with Hegel. In my view, you cannot say such a statement in philosophy. I mean, if you say negation, then it relates to everyone who, who wrote on negation. Everyone has a right to write on negation. Take a microphone. Philosophy is like, you know, it's a very inflatable word, so you can, uh, I mean, imply. No, I mean, uh, that, that Virno, because I also know his work. I was editing Russian translation of Gram of Multitude, and I had also some conversation with him, and so on and so on. Uh, he definitely uh, works uh, through a different line of philosophy. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, we I could, agree with we that. We could discuss I it later, certainly, certainly. I think. 